So there's this talk on uh, Tuesday, I think, um, and I wish I could remember who did it. It was one of the indie rant micro talks. And somebody was bemoaning Unity. He's saying how he hated Unity, really doesn't. Um, mostly because it uh, sort of absolves people collectively of responsibility, of curiosity, right? They're no longer curious about the hardware, they're no longer curious about making stuff, making engines. Um, anyway, it uh, has nothing to do at all with my talk. I just thought it was a super interesting and, and compelling perspective um, that I thought I'd like to share. Uh, I am Mike Acton, I'm the engine director at Insomniac Games, um, and uh, in spite of what the title is, I'm not really here to talk about code. Um, it will probably come to no surprise to some of you that I'm going to talk a lot about data today. Um, you can find me on Twitter and all the places. Uh, but I'll start with this new, new analogy, right? Let's try something new. I don't know anything about wood carving, I literally don't. Like I know what I Googled in order to make these slides. Um, so I see a guy, there's a guy here with a chainsaw and a big log. Seems to be making some bears. Um, there's this design that was sculpted by a laser. So uh, what I can infer from these is that in wood carving, when you have different problems at different scales, you use different tools. Um, so for instance, at this scale, you might use a Dremel, right? So on the scale of tools in wood carving, I imagine there's more, but for our purposes, for the purposes of analogy, um, we have chainsaw to Dremel to laser. The compiler is about in this space. Um, so the question is sort of how to make best use of any tool, and in particular, in, in our case, the compiler. Um, and there's nothing rocket science about this, right? You solve the part of the problem that the tool can't help with. In the case of the Dremel, you start with the chainsaw. If you've got a big log, you get that, you get that stuff down first. Um, whatever other tools you need to use. You prepare the area the tool can help with, and you solve details missing, missed by the tool, using the tool as intended. So even if you use it really well, there's bound to be things that it missed because the tools aren't perfect, they're just tools. Um, so, how does this apply to our use of a compiler? So, part one. It's all the part of the problem the tool can't help with. Um, there are a couple approaches to this, which I will lay out in classic either way A or B, and there's nothing else fashion. Uh, approach number one, you can estimate the resources that you have available. You can triage based on cost and value estimates. You can collect some data. You can adapt then as cost and value predictions change based on the data you collected. This is also known as engineering. Uh, approach number two, you don't worry about any resources. You desperately scramble to fix when running out of resources. This sounds like environmental policy, actually. Um, which can generously be described as irrational and is certainly not engineering. Um, and to, to make perfectly clear, the desperate scramble when you're running out of s resources is not optimization, it's a desperate scramble. Um, we are, you know, our environment policy is not optimizing our use of, of uh, um, non-renewable resources, for instance. So the problems are there even if you choose to ignore them. They're always there. You can, you can either engineer for the problem research the problem, collect data, or you can ignore it at your peril. Um, so the first thing we need to really understand is what the bottlenecks in our problem are. What are we trying to deal with? So what is most insufficient for the demand? You know, what's the top thing? So let us play the experimental game of running stuff live, which Okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, is that on the correct one? Duplicate. 
Here we go. See, that wasn't that hard. Okay, we're in, we're in a shell. Great. So we're going to start with something very easy, really simple. Um, so we have this um, 8K by 1K sized block of data, 32-bit integer values, um, scaled by the width here, um, which in this particular case is 2. Right? So we have two tests. We have test zero, which goes down the columns, in this case two. Uh, and we have test one, which goes across the row. And then we time it appropriately. Uh, so for timing purposes, I'm just gonna do this simple, just run each one of these. You run the test 100 times and collect the data, right? So let's do that. And I'm very confident that this will not crash or have any problems. Takes a while, as it should be when you're collecting lots of data. All right, we're done. I obviously pre-compiled that because I don't trust it that much. Um, so let's go. And so I'm trying to give you a sense of my process as well. So I'm going to insert the the insert the data here. Okay, space, that's all good. There's all our data from all of our runs, right? Let's turn that into a table. Yes. And let's get a chart in here, because charts are cool. Can we see that? No. All right. So what do we see? Um, we see that uh, in this case, let's say the average is about four and a half milliseconds for going across the rows and about seven and a half milliseconds for it going down the columns, right? So let's look at some pre, and that's just run on this machine just now. Uh, so let's look at some pre-set up data for our two, our width equals two case. So over a course of 100 runs, um, our average is about 4.7 milliseconds for going across the rows and about 7.7 for going down the columns, right? It's about 1.6 times slower to go down the columns. That's only mildly interesting. So now what we're going to do is we're going to vary width and we're going to see how that impacts our performance, right? Just for some numbers, just to understand the problem a little bit better. So now width is 4. Uh, in this case, we see an average of about 15 milliseconds for going down the columns, which is about four times slower than going across the rows. We vary width to eight. This is right now our average is about 29 milliseconds, um, which is about eight times slower than going across the rows. You notice that going across the rows stays a stable time. 16 width uh, is about six, takes about 60 milliseconds to go down the columns, which is about 16 times slower than going across the rows. And so forth, 32. It sort of levels out here because it can't possibly get any worse than this. Um, and we go up to 512 width, which is about 22-ish times slower than going across the rows. Um, so let's... So what can we infer? from that data. So we take one of the examples, width equals eight example. Uh, so from that case, if we say we want a 30 frames per second frame rate, for example, we know it's about 33 milliseconds. If we say um, our average, what this means, width is eight, right? Our average reads, uh, 32 bit reads are plus or minus 32 bytes from the previous or the next one on average. Um, that means we can read about three megabytes per frame total um, if, uh, if that's our average distance and the way we're reading. By contrast, reading the row in order in this particular example, uh, non-optimized but very straightforward, um, we can read about 8.9 times that, uh, which is about 34.7 megabytes per frame. Um, we need to be able to read and write lots of memory per frame, 
maximizing that is a uh, is important. Knowing the limits of that, knowing that I can't read if I if my average is three megabytes per frame, I can't actually edit more data than that, is important to know when I'm writing my whatever my system is, my game, my whatever it is. Um, in the worst case we saw with Withy was 512, we had a 20 times difference, discrepancy between going down the columns and going across the rows. Um, which means that in the, in the case of going down the columns, we can only actually read about uh, 1.19 megabytes per frame in that, in that way. Even though, and I would like to point out, they are algorithmically, or the algorithmic complexity is totally equivalent. Um, you're just iterating over a fixed list, right? Um, and so, you know, when, you when you're thinking about things in terms of algorithmic complexity, um, I think it's important to remember, not just in when you're dealing with parallelism where it tends to fall apart more quickly, but even in very simple, very straightforward cases, we can be talking about much more than a single order of magnitude, even the most trivial case. Um, and so, using it as an estimate of cost is dubious in, in most of the situations that, that we encounter in real life. Now, it's important to note that the gap represented here uh, between going down the columns and going across the rows uh, is in fact representing doing nothing. You're accomplishing nothing in this time. So you're just sitting around waiting for an extra uh, 79 milliseconds for exactly the same data. So why is that? Uh, so Jason Gregory's book, which I recommend that you check out, um, uh, it's, so if we look at this chart, um, the most important thing to take away from here is that the difference between reading from data in, say, L1 cache uh, and reading it from main, rent, main memory is about two orders of magnitude, right? Um, and if we say it's about approximately about 200 cycles for a good rule of thumb, reading from memory, uncached values, um, that gives us a sense of how long it takes to get the memory that we need. Um, by comparison, uh, what, we, what we would normally and naturally consider slow instructions. Uh, square root, for example, I think it's familiar for most people to sort of do, avoid trying to do square roots in your code, even though um, they take maybe 15 cycles by comparison. Um, or probably the most expensive functions, uh, instructions in x64 are the transcendentals, um, and they're roughly on the order of one read from memory. So um, let's have another view of this. Reading from L1, reading from L2, a little bit slower. Reading from memory. And in that time, we could have done, what, 10 square roots and a whole bunch of work. Um, so let's verify. Our, right now, the hypothesis is that um, it's memory access. That's, that's making the difference between these two cases. So let's verify it. And how can we do that? Really simple method, right? There's nothing complicated about this. So all we're going to do is only read, we're going to skip every eight. Um, values here, so, um, uh, and then we'll see what the results are. So let us really. This is gonna get really tedious if I have to do that every time. All right, cool, yes, we can see this. Uh, so this is combined, this is running, the run here on the left is all the data from running it um, with skipping every eight, and the data on the right is the original data from our case of 64 width. So what do we see? I know it's difficult to read, but I can point out a couple of things. There are actually, right here, in the orangey bit you see here, there are actually two lines overlapping each other. 
that's because going across the rows is, has effectively been unchanged. The time is identical, uh, for all intents and purposes, identical. Um, which means that our previous case of reading eight times the data, we read all the extra data for effectively free, right? Because it was in the cache. Um, and this data verifies that for us. Um, and if we look at the going down the columns case, we see that it went from taking about, you know, say 90 milliseconds to taking about 11. So it's about eight times faster now because we are in fact reading eight, one eighth the number of cache lines going down, right? So I think experimentally we have verified our hypothesis, at least in this particular case, um, and it reinforces the idea that the number of, the amount that we're trying to re request from memory is the most significant factor here. Do a little dance. All right. So going from the case where we're taking 87 milliseconds to the case where we're taking three and a half, um, is not about optimization. This is about making reasonable use of resources. This is about preparing the area for when we're actually going to be using the compiler. Um, this is about engineering. Um, and knowing that memory access is the most significant component that we're dealing with. So when we're talking about figuring out our bottleneck, the question uh, that gets asked is, is everything always about memory access and the cache, that's all we're ever going to talk about. Um, and the answer is no. Uh, it's about whatever the most scarce resource is. Um, and in other cases, for instance, when you're accessing off a disk or hard drive, it's about access time. Um, when you're talking about the GPU, it's often draw counts. It's whatever the most scarce resource is. But when we're talking about, in particular, we're talking about a, an x64 or a modern CPU, and we're talking about code that's running on on a modern CPU, inevitably we're going to be talking about memory access time. Um, but it is always about the data. So let's look at this another way. So there are things that we can do, um, simple and obvious things that we can look for in the code, in the systems that we're dealing with, in the data, um, and we can do some back of the envelope calculations and we can make, have substantial wins just by doing some very straightforward, looking at the problem in a very straightforward way. Um, so. Here's an example that Andreas Fredrickson posted on his blog uh, a couple of years ago. Just a very simple game object, as you can imagine, um, and a function called update foo, which updates uh, some m foo value here with a couple of multiplies, right? There's nothing unusual or tricky about this. So we, we first look at what it you know, what the assembly output looks like. Uh, and again, just quick and dirty, sort of looking at, the, looking at what it outputs, making some back of the envelope calculations are gonna get us our, the benefit that we're looking for. So we see we're doing two 32-bit reads here, but we can see the distance from each other by the offset there, uh, and that we can be pretty confident that they're on the same cache line. Um, so we'll give a, a single estimate of about 200 cycles as a rule of thumb. But we also know that we're wasting about 56 of our 64 bytes, that we're just not using the rest of the, the data on that cache line. And here we're doing some math, some float mole add, we'll estimate this to be about 10 cycles. Um, let's assume that that is actually the square root PS or something like that, and this will estimate it to be about 30, be really generous. Um, we have a multiply back into the same address that's already in cache from our previous offset, um, so we'll estimate that to be fairly quick, about three cycles. Um, and we have a read and add from a new line here, uh, which we then would have to estimate to be, again, based on the cache read, rule of thumb, about 200 cycles. Um, and here, again, we waste about 60 of our 64 bytes. Assuming your cache line is 64 bytes wide, we, we waste about 60 bytes of that, because uh, we're simply not using it, <coughs> which amounts to about 90% waste. Um, or alternatively, about 10% of the capacity of those cache lines being used, um, which is not the same as used well, but used is a good metric. Um, so as another point of view, the time spent waiting for the L2 versus actually doing some work is about 10 to one. Um, that one 
is the compiler space, which we'll get to. Uh, so the compiler can solve somewhere between one and 10% of the problem space that you're dealing with. Um, one being uncommon, honestly, it's usually a much, much smaller space than that. Um, the vast majority of the things, uh, of the, the parts of our problems that we deal with are things that the compiler can't even reason about, like we're talking about, in terms of data layout, in terms of, of your actual cost. Um, compiler is a tool, or Dremel, uh, not a magic wand. Uh, it cannot solve the most significant problems that you have. Uh, so, in this particular case, we have a quick, you know, quickly, we have an alternative. Um, we can make very simple modifications to the data layout. In this particular case, we can have uh, six full cache lines, um, which represent 32 input values that we would need, six full, uh, two full cache lines that represent our output values, 32 of our output values, and then we just have a simple function that iterates through them. Um, based on those six cache lines, we can estimate quick back of the envelope calculations here, right? We can estimate that we can get about five and a third loops per cache line read. And again, quick back of the envelope calculation, uh, we'd say let's call math about 40 cycles over 5.33 loops, which means it would take about 213 cycles per cache line. Again, really rough, and we're just doing this to figure out if we're in the ballpark. So uh, in this case, we would estimate that um, using the cache, cache line properly, filling it up properly, would give us around about a 10 times speed up. So let's measure it. In this particular case, in that exact code, um, in this, on this particular machine, um, it measured to be about 6.8x uh, faster. Um, so, at this point, now we know that our measurements are slightly off, but we were in the right order of magnitude anyway. Um, and we could dig in a little bit further, examine the problem in more, more detail, but simple back of the envelope calculations are what get, could give us this kind of improvement, not the compiler. So, part two. Prepare the er area that the tool can help with. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the code generator part of the compiler. Uh, there's a pretty good page on this in the LLVM docs. Uh, not surprisingly called code generator. Um, and I just want to go through the, the main, the main goal, goals of the code generator um, and sort of what we can do as programmers to help sort of help the compiler along. Well, what basic things can we do to simplify things for the compiler to get better results? Um, so, one of the things that the code generator needs to do is instruction selection. Obvious, it needs to select the, the appropriate instructions for the machine that it's generating code for. Um, and from your point of view, you want to consider what instructions actually exist on the target hardware um, and map the data and the code that you have to instructions that actually exist. For instance, if your hardware does not have a square root, you probably want to, re want to understand that so that you understand the cost of doing that. If your hardware does not have a multiply, you need to understand that and know that there is no instruction that it will map to. Um, if it does not have 128-bit type, you need to understand that, whatever. You need to understand your target hardware so that you know what potential instructions that it can map to. Uh, scheduling and formation, so the compiler needs to be able to schedule all the instructions, which is sort of its goal. Um, it needs to be able to move them around, which in order to move them around, it needs some opportunity, right? Um, it needs to be able, it needs to have instructions to move around, instructions that are not completely bound by being re dependent on the previous instruction. So you need to make sure that you give the compiler some opportunity to schedule. Um, in particular, you want to think about you know, your estimates against data access, that, you know, you're not, you, everything, it's, you don't have just a function that only uses the, requires knowing the data the, in the previous instruction, so as you're doing a couple of other things, it has some, uh, some move, some room to move. Uh, it does SSA-based machine code optimizations. Um, um, SSA is sort of single static assignment form, um, which we can do manually, and often, it helps simplify the code by doing it manually, um, which is just to say, you just declare and use and assign the variable, the local variable, only once, use it just once and create a new one when you need it. 
straight down the line. Keeps the code very simple and straightforward and helps the compiler. Register allocation. Uh, obviously, register coloring is a huge part of what the compiler will do. Um, and from your part, what we can do to help is to copy to and from locals in register sizes and types. Dealing with values in terms of where they're likely to go and what registers will help the compiler. Prolog, epilog code insertion, not much that we can do, don't really care. Um, late machine code optimizations. Um, probably the most significant thing to pay attention here is paying careful attention to inlining and sort of what it does and looking at what code actually gets generated. Um, it's too easy to sort of blow up the compiler based on what gets inlined or doesn't get inlined. Uh, code emission. Um, the main rule of thumb here is, I mean, obviously the code generator needs to emit code, um, but just verify the assembly output regularly. Just look and see what's there. Make sure it meets your expectations. Uh, Andreas Fredrickson said, I believe in his talk or about an hour ago, um, compilers are good at applying mediocre optimizations hundreds of times. Um, that's generally true. Compilers are not all, for all their vaunted sophistication, they're very easy to confuse. Um, and most of that work is on you. So three easy things you can do to prepare the area for the compiler. Uh, analyze one value, host, hoist all loop invariant reads and branches, and remove redundant transform redundancy. So analyze one value. So find any one value or implicit value. Anything you're interested anywhere in the code base, it doesn't matter. Print it out over time. Uh, uh, it helps if you sort of tag it so that you can grab it out from your printout. Grab your printout and paste it into Excel. This is a very simple, straightforward method. Um, sometimes you can use a script, whatever you wanna do here. The, uh, the, the value of this is in the exercise of grabbing one value and looking at it. See what you see. Um, this is, this is about examination. This is about looking at your data. Um, you're inevitably going to be surprised by something. Um, so I'll give you an example from, from our game, <coughs> Sunset Overdrive. Uh, we have a component called sound source based component, which not surprisingly deals with sound sources. Um, and so I just wanted to look at the number of sources that a particular, this particular component was looking at. So I just dumped this piece of information um, across, a, across a run of the game uh, and wanted to see what I would get. One piece, one very simple piece of information. This is what I got. I discovered an interesting fact. Um, uh, so about 20,000-ish of the 20,000-ish sound components had zero sources uh, and we're all, they were all being updated. Um, so approximately 0% of the sound source components had a source, um, which in our system means that they're not actually playing anything yet. Um, so the answer is straightforward. Switching from evaluating, switching to evaluating from source to component rather than component to source it was the difference between 20,000 cache line reads and 200. Um, for the, just having looked at that one piece of data randomly. Second thing you can do is hoist all loop invariant reads and branches. Um, so don't re-remember very values or recall functions when you already have the data, right? Hoist all loop invariant reads and branches, even the super obvious ones that should already be in registers, member fields especially. So let's look at an example. Uh, if you look at this code, nothing special about it. Um, it's equivalent to, it's just a much more complicated way of expressing this expression, right? Um, and in fact, if m need parent update was an integer instead of a bool, uh, then it, we wouldn't even need to do the comparison. Um, so what happens when we compile this? Uh, in Visual Studio, here's our assembly output. Um, unsurprisingly, 
Um, we're doing essentially what the code says. It's doing the reread and test. It's incrementing the loop. Um, it's doing essentially the trivial reduction of exactly what you asked it to do. Um, the vaunted optimizer isn't doing much optimization. Um, so why is that? Um, you'd have some potential theories. Unfortunately, Visual Studio is a relatively closed space. Like it's hard to it's hard to reason about what the compiler is doing. Um, but you know, you could guess about super conservative aliasing rules, or you know, some some theory that it, the compiler or a system in, within the compiler believes that the, the member value might change within the side of the loop. All entirely reasonable hypothesis, I think. Um, so what about a compiler slightly more aggressive, like Clang? What do you get? Uh, you pretty much what you would hope for here, actually, um, which is just sort of tests the, the bool and, uh, and returns count, assuming that uh, it's true. Uh, so it reduces to exactly the thing that we'd hope for. So what if we make it slightly more complicated? These two, together, are also the equivalent of exactly the same expression. Uh, Baz just calls bar, which then just does the check here, right, based on this result. So uh, we would expect it to be exa to generate exactly the same code that we just saw. Um, it's just a slightly more complicated way of expressing that. Uh, no, Clang throws up all over itself in this example, um, but at least it, it managed to inline them together, so that's good. Uh, Visual, Stu Visual Studio didn't fare any better at all. About the same result. So what can we do? What do we do as programmers? Um, what are the ways that we can help prepare the area for the compiler? Again, don't reread re member val values or recall functions when you already have the data. So um, we're going to hoist the read of m parent update outside the loop and assign it to a local value. Right? And logically, nothing's changed um, except potentially the aliasing issue. Um, we're going to hoist the call to bar in the bas function outside the loop. We know that the result cannot change inside that loop because it's based on the same values, right? So we, we hoist it up. But that requires knowing, of course, what that function does. Um, so what do we get? Bam. Clang can totally reason about this, and we get exactly the result that we would hope for. My Visual Studio, however, does not. Um, that's not to say there's no hope. There is hope. Um, we also, we, so while we hoisted our actual reads and assigned them to a local value, we know that our branches actually were, re were still inside the loop, um, and our branches were also invariable, um, so we can just hoist them out as well and do the, do the check outside the loop entirely. Um, these are logically equivalent transforms. So Visual Studio, great. Now, it spits out essentially what we hope for. There's an, extra, there's an extra branch, but whatever. It's pretty darn close to what we would hope for. It can reason about it based on some very simple transformations that we could do um, to help prepare the area for compiler. So the third thing that we could do um, is remove redundant transform redundancy, which I'll say a couple of times. Um, often, especially with small functions, there's not enough context to know when and under what conditions a transform will happen. Um, and it's easy to fall into overgeneralization. And for us, it's only real cases with real data that we're concerned with. So here's a little gem from our real code. So pay special attention to this m delete files member here. Um, some scene editor code. Um, and the important no thing to note here, <coughs> the thing that stood out to me, uh, is that we're doing a conversion from a wide character to a character string, um, which is suspicious because I personally know that we don't handle wide character conversion consistently across our code base. Um, so having this happen here throws up a red flag for me. Um, so I start to dig. I'm like, okay, I'm curious. Let's see what's, ha what's happening here. Um, so I look inside file delete and see what's happening. I see in here, inside this function, there's a call to the other of our functions called file path prep for win, uh, which I happen to know um, do a conversion from a character pointer to a wide character pointer. So it takes the character pointer we created and converts it right back, right? Um, so let's look at where the da data was written in the first place. Things to note are that it takes a character pointer in the first place, which it then 
converts to a wild character pointer in order to put it into the array that we just read. So what's happening here? Let's review. We convert from a character pointer to a wide character pointer in order to store it in mdelete files. So that we can convert it from a wide character pointer to a character pointer to give it to file delete. So that we can convert it from a character pointer to a wide character pointer to give it to windows delete file. So where does the character pointer come from in the first place? Um, comes from argv, which, we n which is always there and we never needed to touch the memory in the first place. So, which then turned out to be a command line parameter that we actually never used anywhere. So, which brings us right back to the wood carving analogy. <laughs> uh, we just deleted it all. Part three. Solving details missed by using the tool as intended. Um, this is really where optimization happens. After you've done a reasonable approach, understood the data, you've, made, you've prepared the area for a compiler. Um, now, once the compiler's done its job, the compiler's not perfect, you need to actually do some optimization. And for this part, I would just point to Andreas's top previous talk, um, and at, this is the level at which I'm talking about. You talk about SIMD, you're talking about using intrinsics, this is the level at which you are going beyond what the compiler does properly for you. <coughs> which I won't go into any detail on. Because I want to spend time on part four, which is practice. If you don't practice, you can't do what it matters, um, which means understanding the data, which means optimizing, which means um, being able to analyze the data patterns that are coming up in order to transform the problem space that you're working in. You need to do this all the time. Um, so that when it matters, when you actually are presented with a real problem in real life, you have the experience you need in order to solve it. So we are going to play a little game I like to call Let's Run Live Code. Um, so for me, personally, here is something I like to do, and it's an exercise I gave both to myself and the team, is... Uh, Integer sequences. Um, oh, for crying out loud. Integer sequences, yes. I hope everybody knows the site, it's awesome. Um, so, what did I do? For the purpose of this exercise, I just picked one, any one, it doesn't really matter. Um, this one, I, I like the look of this one. It looked good. Um, and so what did I do? I took one of, there. you can see that there are quite a lot of um, example solutions to this, how to generate the sequence here. So I looked through here, I took one that looked good, um, which I believe is this one here. So this one by Joe Riel, for no particular reason other than it looked like it fit on a couple lines. Cool, I just took this maple seek generator. So this is where I'm starting. My, my goal as, as practice, as for my own purposes, is to just take this and say, what can I learn from it? And just dig in. Um, so what did I do? Starting here. So what I did first is I made a little JavaScript version, which is as close as I could get to the uh, Maple description here in JavaScript. Um, I didn't do anything special. I just pretty much, in oh, that spacing is wrong, sorry. Uh, I just pretty much interpreted it as, as closely as I could to the description here in the code. Uh, and then just time the result, right? Uh, ran it across, I wanted to create 20 values in the sequence. Can you read that all right? Can I make that bigger? Yeah, okay. Um, and that's it, right? That's where I wanna start, and then see what happens. And then go from there. So, we are actually gonna run this. How long does it take? Any guesses? Clearly more than a second. More than five, for sure. Not more than 10 minutes, because I'm gonna be out of time. 
it takes a while. We're only tw for 20 values in the sequence. It seems to take longer because I'm up on stage and <laughs> we're waiting. All right. 31 seconds, about. All right. 31, 31,218 uh, milliseconds. So, for the purposes of demonstration, 31,218 for a big reveal later. Um, so in Excel, right. So what was the first thing that I did? Sorry, let's go back. Um, now that I have some baseline, I know how long it takes, now I want to start examining the data and see what, what, I, can, what I can do with it. Um, so let's look at the first transform that I did. Test one in JavaScript. Um, here, I just looked at the, this function A, which is, these functions are just strictly named from the originals. Um, I looked at this function A and I said, okay, I just want to print out the values that come into this function A. I want to see what it is, what's happening. Um, that's it. Maybe I'll learn something. So, I have no other information. Um, I look at what gets spit out from this function A. A couple of things, just watching this data um, and examining sort of the output file, uh, one couple of things are immediately obvious to me. Uh, one, the information density here is extremely low. Um, a lot of the exact same value. Um, and for each one of these inputs into A, we know that A is being recalculated for the exact same input, right? Um, and just in sort of eyeballing it, it kind of looks like there's potentially a triangular sequence going on in here. Um, and, but I don't know, but I'm just guessing. Because anyway, this is about my process and I'm guessing as part of that. So, what did I, what next did I do? Let's look at, um, uh, so I output A, but then I just changed, um, I here, I just changed where the new line was so that I could verify whether or not it seemed like a triangular sequence. And if we see right up front here, that looks, just looking at the first few rows, very suspiciously like a triangular sequence, right? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, this is the right direction to go, something to do with this, right? Um, but I stop and I think, okay, really the most important thing here is the information density, that we are really calculating these exact same values, two and one and three and occasionally four and sometimes seven, um, these exact same values so many times. So let's, let's fix that first before we come back to this, because that seems like the most important thing. So what was the next thing that I did? Test three. I went into A here and here and I just memorized the results, right? If I have already seen this answer, if I've already gotten this input into A, I already have the answer, I'm just gonna return it. And then I'm just gonna store the answer here in the end, right? Makes sense, sensible. Um, and then let's see, now I ha since I have a change, a proper change now, um, I wanna see what difference that makes. That's Six milliseconds. All right. That's pretty good. Let's put that in there. So what was next? What did I do next? Still haven't done anything with that triangular sequence, but that's all right. Um, inside the function A, I'm looking inside this loop, and I'm like, okay, some this I, this this loop strikes me. I don't know anything about this 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 integer sequence, like mathematically. Um, I'm just digging into the data. So it's built up of these three components, um, the sum. So I'm saying, okay, I'm interested in these what these three components actually are. So I'm just going to print them out again. That's it. I'm just printing them out so that I can look at them and examine them. Um, and so that's it. So no test four. And <coughs> I'll pull this pre-prepared thing out of the oven. Test four. This is what I got. 
So I'm looking at these values, and I say, okay, I don't know. I stare at these numbers for a while in Excel, and I don't know exactly what I can do with this yet. Um, but it's good to have, so I, leave, I create a sheet and I leave it here, um, and just go back. So what's the next thing? Test, the next thing, test five, that I did um, is, um, saved what's happening in S, the S function here, right, M of S. Test five, all right. So let's look at that, what did I get from that? Five. All right, this is good value, interesting values here. Um, some triangular matrix happening, uh, which points again back to the triangular sequence that I might have been interested. Maybe there's some connection here, I don't know yet. Uh, but I'm looking at the values and I'm not sure, again, what I can do with it. But one thing I do know um, is because I am memoizing the result, if I'm, say, trying to calculate this result, I do have all of the previous results to work with. So it can be any combination of any of the previous results um, to make this result if I can figure out how that works. But in this case, I'm sitting and I'm looking at it, I'm not, I'm not sure how it works yet. So I go back to the code. Uh, and here, I say I already have, previous, and previously I had memoized the result of, of the A function, right? So I'm like, okay, I have these values as well. Again, I'm looking for what values I already have and see how they might correlate. Um, and here, interestingly, uh, I see that there's a, com there's a combination. There is a, there is a connection between the data I already have and the current data. Um, and this is really just by examining this matrix, right? What I see is, as I'm looking around, I see that, for instance, this value, if I'm trying to calculate this value 200, um, it's made up of 115 plus 85, which are two values that I already have. If I'm trying to calculate this value 60, it's made up of 48 and 12, which are values that I already have. 22 is made up of 20 and 2. And you can see that there is a pattern to the, the reading in this data. Um, so I encode this pattern here, because any, and I only did these three, and I said, okay, it looks like a pattern, seems right. Um, this is how I would encode it um, here, down here. And since I've already memorized A, here, it's just the sum of these two values. Um, so, I run the next test. Now, what I also do is validate that the output sequence, since I only did the sampling and I only tested a few, I want to validate that the whole output sequence continues to be correct, right? And it is, which validates, which validates the hypothesis that it, this is the actual pattern. Um, but now we have a new time, which is 0.619 milliseconds. Great, that's, that's better. We'll put that in there too. So, now what do I do? Test seven. I hope this sort of pre this review through just a my process on a practice example is helpful. Um, so on seven, uh, I said, okay, well, I want to do essentially the same transforms to um, A that I just did to S. You know, I want to look at the data in the same sort of way and see if I can come up with a similar kind of result. So I know that A has this loop in it, this, this K loop, which I already had looked at the, the values in it, A, B, and C. Um, Instead, I'm going to look at the result value, the combination, D, those, with those three multiplied together, the actual sum that gets added, across this loop, um, just because it looks interesting, and see what, what happens. What do I get? So, test seven. So I run that. Okay, looks good. Then I open up, I pull that into Excel, test seven. All right, I look at this. Um, and this, so this is my, this is, based on the A function. Um, I don't see 
particularly anything that I can do here. I have the previous bit values. I don't see any way of connecting it. But I'm pretty confident that there is something at this point. So I go into test. I make another change here. And this is really, the exercise here is really about just looking at the data, trying to understand it, poking around, making changes, making guesses, validating them. Here, I mean, I had a, just a guess. I'm like, well, one of the three values that we're multiplying together is this k, which is just the loop iterator, essentially. So I'm going to remove that from the thing that I'm actually printing out, because I can always put that back in. Um, and I, the two values that I really un want to understand here are b and c anyway. Um, so I just print out the, su the, the, the product of b and c. All right. Which is here. Here, I have, okay, I spend a little time, a lot of time probably, too much time, just looking at this particular spreadsheet. Just looking at it, trying different things, trying how, how I could use previous data to create the current data. Um, and then I see this particular pattern. I see that there is a form, d equals a times b plus c, in which you can get the previous, the current result from the previous results. In this case, say 200 is 115 times 1 plus 85. 60 is 48 times 1 plus 12. 44 is 20 times 2 plus 4. Um, again, there's a nice, obvious pattern going on here. So my hypothesis is this is the form, and these are the values based on the data that I see. Um, so I will encode that into test 9, um, which, of course, because we did the transform to A, and we know that these are the three, the hypothesis is that these are the three values. There's no longer an S, like that function is now gone. Um, and we're gonna print them out and verify our results. Make sure that it's right. Yep, yep, the sequence is correct. Um, and we have a new timing, great. 0.537 milliseconds. So now I'm pretty comfortable with the, my understanding of the data at this point. I'm pretty comfortable with my approach. Um, this is this part of um, doing the, you know, understanding the data before you work with a compiler. And so my next stage is actually to write the C version, which is the, now the part where we're prepping the compiler. So this is a, just a straight up conversion of what I had just written. Um, and you can see some of the patterns that we talked about. Um, I'm pulling it, I'm hoisting anything that's invariant outside of the loop. Um, there's a little bit of SSA form going on here, um, just minimizing the amount of motion going around. Um, and it's very straightforward. Like there's not much happening. Minimizing the number, trying to minimize the number of reads, and making it very clear when I'm reading. Um, all the same techniques that we talked about here. So, now I run the, this test. Great. We have a new time, which is about 42,000 ticks, which is about 0 0.02 milliseconds. So we go back to here. So that means um, in this particular case, it's about 1.6 million times faster than my original test. Um, based on a little bit of analysis of the data. My previous timing here from yesterday is about 2.5 million times faster than my original implementation. Um, and again, this is based on just sitting down and analyzing the data and analyzing the patterns and this practice of doing this. This is particular example is just about me taking a case, any case, it doesn't matter, and just practicing the process and giving that um, and doing that as often or as much as I can, and hopefully giving you some insight into what my process is in practice rather than just talking about it. Um, and because I cannot give any talk, and since I'm just not gonna switch, how about that? I can't give any talk without mentioning three big lies. Um, I will, which is to say that it is a lie that software is a platform. It is a lie that the code should be designed around the model of the world, and it is a lie that code is more important than data. Um, the hardware, the platform is the platform. We need to understand the hardware that we work on. There's no magic software ether that software runs on. Um, 
the code needs to be designed around model of the data, the reality of, the, of what you're actually dealing with, and the data is clearly and obviously the most important thing. Um, and that's it, thank you. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions or arguments, if we have any. No? All right, thanks. <laughs>